So I am joined here today by our host, Professor Ian McInnes. Um, as some of you may already know, Ian took a post as Vice Chancellor and Head of College to the College of Medical, Veterinary and Life Sciences in October 2020. He is currently President of the European League Against Rheumatism and a global leader in the field of arthritis research. So just before I hand over to Ian, I have a few items of housekeeping. This webinar is being recorded and we will send you a copy following the event. So you're very welcome to rewatch it at your leisure. If any questions come to mind during the presentation, I'd encourage you to put them in the chat function. Uh, and I think one of my colleagues will just demonstrate how to do that now. We have had a couple of questions posed in advance and we'll ask Ian to respond to those first. Hopefully they will spark your curiosity and inspire further questions from everybody here today. So I am now going to hand over to Ian to kick off. Um, Ian, over to you. So thank you so much to all of you for making time to join us. And it's a, I, there are one or two old friends on the, the call and I think some new friends, but I, I think in the interest, particularly of those who have not met me before, my, my name is Ian McInnes. I'm by way of background, a clinician. I started out as a rheumatologist, uh, once a rheumatologist, always a rheumatologist, I, I think is the truth of the matter. And in the, the, the latest stages of my clinical career, I had the privilege of looking after people with long-term chronic and really complex immune diseases. And over the last couple of years, that means I've spent a lot of time thinking about and, and contributing to the, the response to the COVID-19 crisis, which is indeed what it is. And then a year or so ago, I, I took on the role of the uh, Vice Principal and Head of College of Medical Veterinary and Life Sciences. And that's what I want to tell you a little bit about in the next uh, 10 or 12 minutes or so. So um, the starting point for this conversation uh, should be the, the, the vision and ambition of the University of Glasgow. And, and I, I, I hope none of this is a particular surprise to you. The, the purpose of our university is to transform lives. And we, we do that not by just thinking, although thinking is really important, but we act. We act in the consequences of our thought. The, the mission, therefore, is to, to, to bring a community of, of world changers together. World changers because, as I say, ideas need to form action and action needs to form impact. And that then leads us to take on the title of a world changing university. Now, if we translate that down from the, the university wide level to the, the medical veterinary life sciences college, you can see on the right, I've pretty much cut and paste, but now we're thinking about transforming lives, but using the vehicle of biomedical and life sciences. Although as I, I'll tell you just in a moment or two, that's our primary vehicle in the college, although the college is now very much part of the university and we see ourselves as an integrated, joined up part of the university's journey together. And we'll be using artificial intelligence, computing, digital science, and social sciences, just as we'll be using the life sciences to combat the challenges we all face. But they, that does mean that we will be a, a community of world changers and, and a world changing college. So uh, it, maybe just to start, what have we been up to in the last year since I took up post? Well, the first thing to say is I was filling a very large pair of shoes and it was a real privilege to take on this role from Professor Dame Anna Dominichak, who continues to, to, to serve our community through her activities through the DHSC at the moment. But under Anna's leadership, the college made enormous strides over a decade. And I have to say, it's a little daunting to try and follow such an eminent uh, academic college. But we, we did decide to regroup. Um, the, the, the college was approximately a decade in existence. And so we, we set out three strategies in order to deliver this vision. I, I don't need to read the text for you. And, and I, the, these slides are, are, are I'm very happy to make them available to you if you would find that useful uh, just to, to look and reflect and, and pause. And by the way, I'd also love to pick up questions either tonight in, or this morning in questions and answer or, or simply by, by email or other means of communication at your preference in the, the weeks and months to come. But we set out a, an education strategy. And the idea here is to build world-class teaching programs. We are looking at the curriculums across the board and you're going to see new curriculum coming as a result of that. We're going to be integrating cross-disciplinary and as a for example, we're very excited about joining the, the Adam Smith Business School to the 
to the medical school, to, to the School of Life Sciences, and really start to create fit for the 21st century courses. That's not to ignore our legacy, but it's to take that legacy and build on it in the future so that we can be ever more relevant to the students of the future. We're also going to build scholarship much more clearly into the educational strategy and that scholarship residing in our staff, thereby empowering, enabling, and I think enhancing the educational quality and the feeling of engagement that our primarily teaching members of staff feel. And that's something that we'd recognized would be very important in the college going forward. Our research strategy I'm going to tell you about momentarily, but put simply, we will revisit our origins as a civic university and really focus on the big challenges that face man, human, womankind. And finally, this purple circle, what is innovation, engagement and enterprise? Well, that's the idea that what we do in the college can actually rapidly become, if you like, innovation, it, it, the spinning out of companies, the engagement with the, the wider uh, industry sector, with, with policy, with government, and, and that what we do can rapidly transpose into how the world does its business. And yes, of course, that will build innovation and, and, and enterprise and, and industrial engagement for the university, but it will hopefully sponsor and drive that same innovation in the wider community. And it, it's worth noting that the, the economic impact that the University of Glasgow has demonstrated in recent years is, is in the order of several billion pounds per year in economic analysis that, that uh, Anton recently sponsored on behalf of the university. So to deliver this vision with the strategies that we've now put in place, one of the immediate questions was whether the, the structure of Medical Veterinary Life Sciences College was actually fit for that new purpose. And we, after a great degree of, of soul searching, decided that it was not. And what I'm showing you here is a new structure of our college that is, I'm happy to say, been approved by court all of two weeks ago. Um, I, again, I don't need to read the titles to you, but what I hope you will see is that we've simplified our structure. We used to schools and institutes um, that left the schools away from research and the institutes were not sufficiently research enriched as to be pure research institutes. And that hybrid state, I'm afraid, served neither education nor research purpose. And so we've reverted to the university wide model of having schools. Each school responsible for the delivery of education, research, and the innovation enterprise strategy. Tripartite strategy engaged in each of our units. You, you'll see also a little simplification, infection, immunity, uh, molecular and cellular biosciences. I think that name will probably evolve just following recent staff consultation. Health and well-being, public health, never more important than now. Cancer science, cardiovascular, metabolic health. You'll see this all brought about by the, the union and fusion of different schools and institutes into single unitary entities, commonly managed with integration of staff and student experience. In the center, these green boxes represent centers of excellence, and that's where the research activity will reside. And that you'll see brings together different disciplines. And so our work is inherently multidisciplinary. It is inherently inclusive of the best ideas and the best expertise that will allow us to deliver for the challenges that we face. And, and maybe a little comment in the a School of Biodiversity, One Health and Veterinary Medicine trips off the tongue, doesn't it? I've been practicing for weeks and I can now say it with only the modest flutter now and then. Well, actually, that's a really interesting and new idea. And I'm going to show you a little bit about One Health momentarily. But bear in mind that we will be the first to our knowledge veterinary school in the world that will deliver veterinary medicine training in the context of One Health and planetary safety. That's the breadth of the vision we now have. Now, over the next um, five minutes, I want to just highlight key areas of activity that we as a college, working with our sister colleges, particularly social sciences, science and engineering, though I'm very happy to say that the Arts and Humanities College are part of a recent multidisciplinary and cross university welcome program that we've now had funded. But these are the areas where we believe we can make the maximum impact by bringing the full force of a civic university to challenges that we all face. Health inequalities are an affront to Glaswegian life. 
It's as simple as that. I, I'm actually born and bred in Glasgow. I, I studied in Glasgow. I then travelled and had my education in, in various parts of the world. But I've returned to Gra Glasgow and Serbia with pride. I don't intend to leave anytime soon. It's a wonderful place to live and work. So health inequalities are an affront. It, it, you all, I think, are aware of the gradients of outcome that exists across different regions of our city. And as an affront, there's something that we need to do something about, and that's exactly what we're planning. And so we're going to straddle all the way from molecule to social sciences, an integrated approach to understanding why health inequalities occur at the social sciences level and why they impact so significantly outcomes for people with cancer, with cardiovascular disease, with immune disease, and indeed with COVID. So that's an integration right across the college. And in fact, the university is infused by this, and this will be an integration right across the university. And, and consider, for example, we're, we're hugely excited by, for example, the Claris Piers building in which the, the MRC Centre, which the Institute of Health and Wellbeing, the new school of health and wellbeing, will have a focal area of expertise allowing us to pioneer new interventions, new understanding, and therefore new changes that can be brought about in this really terrible area of, of need. The second major, major area I want to highlight for you is that of emerging global infectious challenges, almost superfluous to explain why that matters at the moment. If COVID has taught us nothing else, it is that we as a species are hugely vulnerable to our environment. And actually, there, there is a long, long history for the last 10 to 15,000 years, Homo sapiens, our life as humans, has been driven by our relationship to infectious diseases. It's actually quite a recent uh, development that other diseases have really mattered because you know, life expectancy a couple of thousand years ago was um, in the, your early 30s. And so the diseases of the older ages really hadn't started at that time. And so we have, a, with our MRC Centre for Virus Research, our Welcome Centre for Integrated Parasitology, and the broad supporting groups who make infectious diseases an area of focal excellence in the university, we see this as an area working cross college and colleges as something that will make a huge difference. And if there are interested questions, I'd be delighted to tell you more about what the university has done in the COVID era. I promise you it's an impressive story. Now, taking this theme of emerging infection, what about the, the, the concept of One Health? Well, first of all, what is One Health? One Health is, generally speaking, the idea that the looking after the animal species noting the interrelationship that the biodiverse environment and animals have, and then our dependence as humans on that interaction. One Health is the idea that if we understand the contribution of animal and animal related diseases, we will understand their relationship in turn to humanity and we can make a difference by that route. So actually very closely related to and complementary to the first two themes that I've laid out, noting that many of the so-called zoonotic diseases, that being those diseases that circulate between animal and man, are of course more prevalent in areas of inequality on a global basis. And I, um, I, I, I should say that that global basis is, is hugely important to us as a university. Now, just as an example of this move from One Health to Global Health, I want to highlight a, 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 a very exciting story. This is a, a conversation that started between Paul Garside, Andy Waters, and myself and Scottish government about seven or eight years ago after a sabbatical that Paul Garside, who's a fantastic advocate for our university, um, Paul went to Malawi on sabbatical and came back with some really fascinating ideas about partnership. And that led to the innovation of the, the Blantar Blantar Laboratory. Here it is being built. Um, just a sign, by the way, that red bricks in Malawi are a lot cheaper than plas uh, plasterboard. That's why the lab is built the way it is. And this is what it looks like now. With, with equipment and kit that we purchased through the raising of several million pounds with Scottish Government, the World Bank, and indeed the, uh, the, the Wellcome Trust. And, and now you see, based on the College of Medicine site, an extraordinary ambition to create a centre that can do world-class translational research on site in Malawi. And of course, the, the university, although we have pioneered and developed this with our partners in the College of Medicine Malawi, we've now given the centre to the College of Medicine. We work in partnership, not in colonial ownership of, and that is a huge difference. And by the way, the work that is being done in the Blantyre Blantar Centre in Blantyre Malawi will inform our health inequalities interventions here in Glasgow, a completely different relationship 
between those of us working in the privileged West and those who are working in developing countries. It is a partnership on equal basis, and that is a model that has now been highlighted in different parts of the world with the recognition at numerous levels, not least Aru, the African Research Universities Alliance, which sees Glasgow as an exemplar of good practice. Coming to close, we are wishing to move uh, to the other major scourge, of course, uh, cancer. Unfortunately, Scotland does rather badly here. You're looking, for example, at colorectal cancer cases, but I'm afraid the, the map is just as, as gloomy, regardless of which of the diseases you look at in the cancer field. Scotland does badly, and Scotland now needs a national level centre. And in, in, in confidence, this will become more publicly available soon. Uh, we, we've just received a, a, a very generous award from CRUK to create a national cancer centre here working in partnership with the University of Edinburgh. This is hugely significant. Partnership with fellow universities in Scotland, the idea that Scotland competes with the world and not within itself is something that I believe in really passionately. And this is our first major example of success with the two largest biomedical universities in Scotland working seamlessly together. My opposite number, Moira White and I speak on a weekly, fortnightly basis, looking at numerous areas that partnership will deliver. It's not that we don't have some gentle internal competition. I have to point out the, the joys and the beauties of Glasgow on a regular basis, of course, to Moira. But that said, we are in serious business together. And finally, I think you probably will have heard a lot about precision medicine, the idea that we can use the modern molecular revolution to offer the right medicine to the right person at the right time. That, that's actually a beautiful model, and, and, and Professor Damana Dominicak has, has really done an enormous and wonderfully important job in, in putting Glasgow on the precision medicine map globally. I think we're now ready to grow even beyond that model. And so our concept is to move from precision medicine to a broader utilization of the college's resources, pathology to precision. We have the largest pathology unit in Western Europe in the Queen Elizabeth University site. Understanding the molecular map of human disease allows us, yes, to choose the right medicine, namely precision medicine. But also, if you follow that logic, understanding the molecular map of human disease allows us to choose interventions, new therapies. So we can actually understand the development of the disease, that is its pathology, understand the best medicines to develop as a result of that new medicine discovery, enterprise and innovation with industry becoming a logical follow on to that. And yes, finally, the application of that medicine at the right time in the right patient population. And this amazing campus that we've developed in the Queen Elizabeth University site, the Govan campus, working now in the new college with much closer relationships across the different laboratories in the Gilmore Hill campus, we see a, a continuum from basic understanding of why a disease occurs all the way through to the application of a medicine that can transform lives and do so at minimum risk to that individual and maximum benefit for every pound or dollar or euro or yen spent. Because Glasgow is a global university. The work we do here will impact the development of medicines and their use on a worldwide basis. So that's my 15 minute spiel. Uh, I was allowed no more than that. That's very good for your well-being. So Margaret has, has wisely selected that time limit. I hope I've demonstrated to you that our, our culture, uh, our structure is one that will be agile and proactive. We are wanting to move to be much more on the front foot rather than responding to the calls that come from National Funding Agency, responding to the challenges of mankind. We wish to anticipate them and be agile and bold, very much more solutions focused than we've been in the past, but all of that underpinned by being a civic university, a university that has over the last five and a half centuries brought extraordinary ideas. It's our turn now and we're very keen to deliver them. And to do that, we've looked at and adjusted our structure so that that culture of innovation and discovery will indeed be world changing. Thanks ever so much for your attention to what I had to say. I'm going to hand back to Margaret now, and I'm hoping there will be time and I hope sufficient curiosity to drive some questions. But Margaret, back to you. Thank you very much, Ian, and thank you for that 
that overview of a, what is a really ambitious and inspirational vision for, for the college. Um, I just wanted to say a big thank you to everybody that has supported um, philanthropically over the last few years. As Ian alluded in his um, presentation, um, our kind of world-class research is underpinned by world-class facilities, um, both in Govan and at Gilmore Hill. In the next year, we look forward to some really exciting milestones um, that have been made possible by the philanthropy we've received over the last few years. So in the early part of 2022, we'll be looking at the, the moving into and opening subsequently of the Advanced Research Centre, which is an extraordinary commitment and visible commitment to interdisciplinary research, which will break down silos and really get to grips with some of the world's biggest challenges, ranging from climate change through to chronic disease. It brings together 600 academics from across all of the schools and the university to, to take that kind of novel approach to research and to create a kind of place where ideation can happen and new discoveries can be made. That will be shortly thereafter followed, um, as Ian mentioned, by the Clarice Piers building, which will be a new home for the Institute of Health and Wellbeing. That building will bring together researchers from 10 sites across the university into one space, looking at what is an a growing area of health inequality and chronic disease, responsible now for a huge number of, of deaths across the world and a massive issue for health and social care systems, both in the developing world and, and in here, kind of in the developed world as well. So um, that is incredibly timely. Um, some of those issues have been hugely exacerbated by the health crisis that we've been living through. So it's really exciting for us to be making such a, an important civic contribution right now, both to Glasgow and to the world as a whole. So thank you to everybody who have contributed to making those two projects possible. Our focus now for philanthropy moves on to the people who will make um, the potential of those buildings come to life. So, you know, the, our research is made possible by PhD students and by postdoctoral researchers who are able to take us into new areas of discovery, to pursue experimental lines, to cross the boundaries of disciplines. So that will be a really big focus for us going forward and um, bringing new, new blood, new life, new minds into, into making some of that research possible. The other thing that's been hugely impacted upon over the last couple of years by the pandemic is student support. So we've seen a, a huge increase in students in need of support in order to both access university and also to continue their studies when they're there. So going forward, talent scholarships, student hardship, humanitarian scholarships will all be major areas of focus for philanthropy. So I would encourage any of you who are interested in continuing to play a part in, in that philanthropic journey for the university and what we're able to achieve for the world to continue to talk to my colleagues and myself and to perhaps meet with us over the next few months in order to continue that conversation. So thank you again for all of your support. Um, now, I am going to kick off with some questions um, which have been sent to us already. Um, and hopefully that will get everybody going in thinking about other questions they might like to put to Ian. So the first one I have um, is, Ian, can you tell us more about why collaboration with our social scientist colleagues is important to health inequalities research, which takes place in the college? Yeah, thanks very much, Margaret. Um, <clears throat> so a, a purely biomedical model of the universe looks at, for example, a, a process, a cell, a plant, uh, in a parasite, and gets about as far as its potential impact on a, on a whole organism, which could be, a, if you're interested in rabies, it could be a dog. If you're interested in malaria, it could be a human. And that's um, all very well. And, a, and the purely biomedical model would, would study those processes without necessarily considering the wider impact that that has at, at the societal level. It's a very empiric and I think overly simplistic view of the world in 2021 and looking forward to 2030. And so... The future, we believe, is going to be driven by the concept of team science. That is that if, if problems have multiple antecedents, it is highly unlikely that a single expertise, a single discipline will be able to deliver the solutions. 
Very rarely that happens. An antibiotic, for example, discovering penicillin. But even then, that was discovered what, how long ago? And we still have problems with uh, bacteria. Uh, so, you know, the, the idea of a, a single expertise having the, the breadth to deal with complex problems is, I think, probably naive upon reflection. And so with um, Sarah Carter, my, my opposite number, the head of College of Social Sciences, we spent a lot of time in the last year thinking about the qualities that each of our colleges can bring to the understanding of these societal challenges. Now, this is not quite as new an idea as perhaps I'm suggesting. The MRC Centre for, um, for Policy, the SPHSU for Public Health, is already a centre that straddles the two colleges, College of Social Science, College of um, Medical Veterinary Life Sciences. So there's an, an inherent collaboration already there. And in fact, over 20 years or so, we've been working mainly in the social sciences of health inequalities. But there is a reality here, and that is that if we look only for political solutions, we could be looking for a long time. If we look only for molecular solutions, similarly, probably for quite a long time. But if we put the two together, we actually think that the kind of complex interventions that will make a difference can be enacted very much more quickly. As of, for example, we are working, we, we have brought together social scientists, diabetes experts, obesity experts, and infectious diseases experts in Malawi in the, it's called Meru Center, which is an epidemiology unit that, that, that Glasgow um, now uh, has. It, we, we, we took this over several years ago, uh, an investment decision that I actually made with my colleagues in, in the Institute of Infection Community at that time. And with them, we are devising complex interventions which require behavioral changes in Malawi, societal changes, political engagement, and then eventually the administration of medicines and lifestyle changes. No one individual discipline can deliver that breadth of intervention, but by bringing the social science and the, uh, the, the, the biomolecular life scientists, we, that team, in fact, is incredible. It includes parasitologists, infectious diseases clinicians, immune disease clinicians, even a rheumatologist who knew, diabetologists, social scientists, and experts in political science. The University of Glasgow brought all of those people together with our partners in Malawi, whose similar expertise joins the partner. I can't emphasize enough this issue. Partnership is the key. The old colonial model is absolutely out the window as far as we're concerned. So that, I hope, is the beginning of an understanding of why so many different people, when brought together, can, can, can properly address the challenge. And one of the reasons why we're in partnership with Edinburgh uh, is that I actually don't think Glasgow University has all of the necessary expertise within our boundaries. And by the way, lest that sound defeatist, my opposite number in Edinburgh agrees when she's considering the University of Edinburgh. We, we now recognise that for Scotland to make an impact, uh, we, we're not competing in Scotland. We're probably not even competing with the, the Golden Triangle, um, Oxbridge and London universities. We're competing with the 128 Beltway in Boston. We're competing with the West Coast of, of the United States. We're competing with Asia and the emerging powerhouses there. And, and competition, I'm a strong believer in competition. It's really healthy because it, it drives innovation. And that innovation in turn drives solutions. So uh, I hope that's a, a helpful way of thinking, not only about social sciences and, and MVLS, but actually the broader idea of why partnerships so much at the centre of our, partner, uh, our, our, our policies going forward. Thanks, it's a great question. Thank you, Ian. Um, you've talked a lot about interdisciplinary research and we've talked also about the facilities that support that. I've got a really good question here from somebody who would like to know um, from Irene. Um, whether the interdisciplinary collaboration will also extend to the student body? That's a very good question. And the answer is yes, it will. And it will depend a little bit in the context. So uh, there, let, let's just work our way through the different kinds of students that may well um, become exposed to this. First of all, if the culture in the college is multidisciplinary, then that will influence the culture across all of the courses. I, I didn't emphasize this particularly in my opening remarks, but the, the new structure of the college that, that I've devised with my, my friends in the, the management group also contains a central educational hub. 
And the reason for that is that we want to prosper scholarship, but we want to share best practice across all of the different schools in the college. But that is also where the culture of the educational environment for our undergraduate and postgraduate taught courses will be set. And so we've actually integrated the management of postgraduate taught master's courses, integrated the management of undergraduate courses, and integrated the, the, the multidisciplinary culture that underpins all of those disciplines. So the students will be involved at one level in the fact that they're being trained in a multidisciplinary environment per se. Their projects will now be multidisciplinary as and when and if required and appropriate. There is a time for focused study and I don't think I want to you know, there are some students who might become a little overwhelmed by being asked to become master of 15 different disciplines at once. So I think this, this, this has to be carefully managed and thought about. The, the, the next sort of order from there would be our postgraduate uh, research students, our, our PhD students. And the university has already thought a lot about this. We have dual supervision. We have external advisory uh, groups put in per se. We, we are now uh, part of multidisciplinary research programs, doctoral training programs. Delighted to highlight the fact that we've recently, at last, after 15 to 20 years of trying, we've managed to get a Wellcome Trust clinical PhD program funded. The way we did that, well, we went to the Wellcome and said, we have a multidisciplinary team focused on something called multimorbidity, which is the coexistence of two or more diseases in one individual. No shock really to you, but that has a very substantial impact on long-term outcomes. We then went to Edinburgh, Dundee and St. Andrews and said, would you like to join us? They said, that's not a bad idea. Let's come together. And so we now have a, a multidisciplinary partnership. So the, the, the PGR students will be embedded in a multidisciplinary environment and many of their projects will, will, will therefore become cross-disciplinary. So at that level, I, I hope our student body is going to become very engaged with this partnership. Uh, it, it's a balance, though, between preserving the integrity of a single degree process with then I think, and the PGR level for me is probably the sweet spot to start to open minds out. I have to tell you, students who come in and say, no, I'm terribly sorry, this is too monosyllabic. You need to be much more broad in your thinking. We're open for business and we'll be as happy to accommodate such students as we can. Mm -hmm. Ian, have you seen the, the recent COVID-19 pandemic and the impact on the NHS um, in the UK have an impact on student recruitment to clinical medicine? Has that kind of... Has that affected applications? And, you know, is there a role that people who've supported students in the past can play in helping to encourage that kind of pipeline of future clinicians? Yeah, that's a very good question as well. Um, so the answer is it's too early for us to know whether it's going to significantly impact numbers. I think it's fair to say that we and indeed most of the other medical schools in the country are already facing an embarrassment of riches in that we have several thousand young women and men uh, applying for entry into our medical school and indeed other medical schools around the country. It's too early to know whether that number will rise with the impact of the COVID pandemic. I, I, I suspect that interest in the delivery of health care has never been higher. Mm -hmm. My suspicion is that we might actually provoke people with broader skill sets and interest into the healthcare business, not necessarily as doctors, but um, it, it's pretty obvious now that AI, that computing digital skills, that uh, the social sciences are every bit as important in dealing with a pandemic. You know, how many people can go and sit in, in a, a, a pub or a, a football game or a rugby match and do so safely? Well, that's not actually something that a doctor knows very much about. That's something that other experts do. So I suspect we'll see an uplift in general interest in health care related applications in times to come. Um, that said, COVID, I mean, if I can broaden the question, if I just mm -hmm. could use this as an example, um, the, I think the COVID has impacted our college, the wider university, just as it has impacted society. I actually, with friends of the university in the room this afternoon, this morning, this evening, I, I, I'd like actually just to pay tribute to my colleagues and actually to our students. The, the, can you imagine double teaching, teaching online, teaching in face to face, and then a week later having to go back to teaching online? Can you imagine having to pivot your lectures from face to face to online in a space of a couple of weeks? Can you imagine dealing with the heartbreaking stories that we're hearing from students who's, this has been, I don't know, I'm, 
my, both of my daughters are student age, and I, I'm, I'm going to argue that they have probably been more impacted than any other stratum in society. And I say that with due respect for, for those who have, have suffered grievous medical harm. And our students have been incredible. Nothing short of amazing. And I suspect that has a lot to do with the behaviour of our staff, which has been nothing short of remarkable. Meantime, the university has also played uh, a central role in the national response to COVID. The, the, the MRC Centre for Virus Research has been at the very centre of understanding the virus as it has changed, as it has mutated. It has been at the centre through the Crush Lab, uh, which is a place where we can make immediate decisions about new therapies, uh, variants of concern. Omicron was in the Crush Lab probably before you were aware that it was in the United Kingdom and the, the guys in there were doing incredible things to understand what it looked like and how it could be combated and you're seeing evidence of that coming through already. Um, the, but the wider college has played a role, cardiologists, rheumatologists, anesthesiologists, all leading or contributing to national studies of real import. Glasgow leads the Octave studies, for example, Octave and Octave Jewel, which are trials that are evaluating whether vaccines work in vulnerable people. What does vulnerable mean? Do you have cancer? Do you have renal disease, liver disease, immune diseases? Glasgow's actually leading those trials. That's not Oxford. You hear a lot about Oxford, they're great, but it's actually Glasgow that's at the front of all of that work, informing policy on a weekly and monthly basis. So I, I, I think actually um, COVID will increase interest, but the outputs of the university, I think Glasgow will take its place with its head held high because of the contribution we have made and continue to make, I can assure you. I was chairing a government committee before eight o'clock this morning, and that will continue through the holiday period and willingly as long as it's required, to be perfectly honest. And I think that in turn will attract new student body into Glasgow and the wider academic community. So I finally just pay tribute to the, the COVID work that's been done in the university has been now recognised in the award of the Queen's anniversary prize. We're hugely proud of that given to CDR and the other COVID workers across the college. And that's something that I think we should all be very, very proud of indeed. So forgive me, uh, Margaret, slightly expanding the question. Um, we started with our students who are vital, but we finished with the interaction that students and staff have. It's really one continuum. We talk about community. It is a community and, and each should feed off the other. Yeah, no, thank you very much for expanding it. Um, I had the great privilege of, of being at the Virus Research Centre last week and seeing some of the, the huge amount of equipment that was being used at the moment to, to play a part in that national effort, um, that international effort, in fact, um, in sequencing variants and kind of understanding the way that, that the COVID um, virus is, is working its way through the population and the impact it might have on people. And um, I just wanted to say again, thank you to some of the people on this call. We had an incredible response to our COVID-19 appeal and, and much of the funds that were, were donated then supported some of those students that were facing huge crises um, and, and having really challenging times throughout that period. But it also funded the equipment that is being used now in, in research that is absolutely vital to, to kind of resolving the current crisis. So thank you for making such a difference there. I um, wanted to move slightly onto it, a different question, um, which was about our role as a global university. So um, Jess was, had asked the question about, um, you know, in terms of our role as a global university, could you give us an example um, of developments in medicine that have had an international impact? I'm delighted to. Um, it's a relative embarrassment of riches, but I want to just counsel a little before I give you a list of 20. Um, when we talk about global impact, I've actually, I've set a really high bar in the college. Words are cheap and words are easy. And uh, every week, uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but cancer has been cured many thousand times this year in the newspapers. But it hasn't been cured in the real world. And so global impact I think has to be very carefully used but let me give you a couple of examples where I believe that actually is probably true so maybe starting with the area of heart failure the work of John McMurray and his colleagues in the soon-to-be school of cardiovascular and metabolic health um, John and his colleagues working with Novartis pioneered a new medicine 
for the treatment of heart failure, the largest um, growing problem as we slowly manage old fashioned heart attacks, so-called ischemic heart disease. Unfortunately, the failing heart muscle continues to be a really pressing problem and the mortality for heart failure is just as bad as bad cancer. So this is a major threat to health. And John's work in developing new targeted medicines to treat heart failure has been nothing short of revolutionary and is in fact something that we're going to build on going forward as we seek to renew our BHF, British Heart Foundation Centre of Excellence. A, a, a second example, uh, diabetes, type 2 diabetes, that's the, the, the one that you maybe don't necessarily get in, in early life in your teenage years when your immune disease attacks the pancreas, but that which is maybe a little more prevalent in the older years when the odd bit of waste expansion can occur when we all maybe eat the wrong diet and all that goes with that. Well, it turns out the work of Mike Lean and Navid Sattar and others has shown that dramatic weight loss, and this is not something you want to try at home without supervision, but really substantial weight loss can reverse type 2 diabetes in its earliest stages. Now, that is a huge and important observation and will save thousands of lives around the world as that is rolled out. But that's partnership with the University of Newcastle, the word partnership coming up again. And maybe as a, I, I, I'm staying away from COVID at the moment because I've already waxed lyrical on the subject and the university's contribution, but maybe a, a third example um, comes from my own area, which is the, the disease of treatment of long-term immune diseases. And please forgive me if that sounds a little parochial, but I happen to know something about it. And the, the work that has been performed in the uh, Centre of Excellence for Inflammatory Arthritis, which is the UK centre funded by Versus Arthritis. It's a centre that Glasgow leads, sharing with Oxford, Birmingham and Newcastle University. But that uh, centre has created the understanding of um, particularly psoriatic arthritis that has now allowed the development of at least two, with a third we hope coming shortly, of new medicines being used in hundreds of thousands of people around the world. And for those who have an inflammatory arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis, that will be appreciated as being a very substantial advance indeed. It's worth thinking that it, arthritis is the single biggest cause of work disability in Europe. So th th there's, there's, yes, there's three examples. I could give you a few others, but because I don't actually want to overclaim, um, th th those are ones that immediately spring to mind because they're out there already, they're making a difference. Our job is to grow the pipeline. Our job is to grow more innovative science in its true sense, the breadth of science, to really make a difference. And that's why I've highlighted for you the, the major themes that we're going to be taking on as a college and colleges plural. Thank you. That's that's it's amazing to hear some of those those discoveries and and I suppose products making their way into the world to help people. That's extraordinary to hear about. Um, you mentioned earlier on um, the collaboration between the College of, of um, Medical, Veterinary and Life Sciences and the Business School. And um, I was on a call recently with somebody who, who is a vet um, talking about the challenges of running a hospital and, um, and indeed dealing with the commercial side of that practice. So I'm really interested to hear a little bit more about kind of that. It's obviously an area that affects increasingly affects people working in clinical practice, but also across life sciences more generally. Um, so what does that collaboration look like and what are your hopes for it for the future? Well, the collaboration is nascent at the moment. So that's uh, we, we've, we've started, particularly at the postgraduate master's level, we've been working with Sarah Carter and her, her colleagues over in College of Social Sciences and the Adam Smith Business School to develop modules whereby folk primarily interested in the life sciences are able to add on a module that has more of a business training element. I, I'm, I'm very excited about that. And of course, that's interesting, but it's nowhere near enough. The, the life scientists, but let me broaden that, the life scientists, the doctors, the dentists, the vets of the future, needs to be really very literate in the area, first of all, of business practice, but I hope also business innovation. And so what we're starting to do is to look at the offering of undergraduate degrees that will combine business studies and life science studies. Now, I have to confess, we're, I think we're a bit behind the curve here. There are several of our competitor universities in the United Kingdom who are already doing that. 
Now, we didn't take the idea from them. And in fact, the Adam Smith Business School is a very eminent organization with their elements and, and unique elements, particularly, I think we can create things that will be very attractive in the marketplace for, um, for, for, for the younger minds. Um, so we'll, we'll, ex we'll develop new undergraduate courses. Uh, that's part of where the new curriculums that I mentioned in my, my opening remarks are going to come from. Um, secondly, we're, we're interested in expanding our master's programs. We'd like those to be attractive to broader industry. And, and we're in discussion with industry partners to say, look, what are your training needs? What, what, what are the gaps in your marketplace? What are the gaps in the people you're recruiting? And how can we help to fill those with you and for you? So we're, we're in dialogue. Now, that's a much more coherent dialogue that we're offering graduates who have both business skills and life sciences and, and, and or professional health caregiving skills. And then... Finally, I, I'm quite interested, we haven't done this yet, but I quite like to create integrated degrees in business studies for our medical students. Uh, th this is, I'm, I'm aware of only one significant course elsewhere, no surprise, it's in Boston, it's, it's, uh, it's as usual, Harvard, MIT, Mass General have got their act together, but I think we can offer the equal, if not the better of that, because there's you know benefits in our relatively uh, petite size. I'm not ashamed to say that when I'm talking about the size of MIT and Harvard. And I think we can offer really bespoke courses in that area. And, and, and that, of course, is going to encourage a different type of applicant into the University of Glasgow. Maybe a, a, a more open mind to innovation, to enterprise, to spin out. Uh, but, but we're going to need those people in the UK and in the global basis going forward. And so as a university, I think we're going to listen as a college, particularly much more carefully to what is it that the marketplace is looking for. So rather than as an academic institution saying we train people and we've done it for five and a half centuries, so don't tell us what to do. I think it's the other way around. We're saying based on five and a half centuries of experience of doing this well, what are your real needs and how do we need to adapt and respond to that? And I think that the relationship with the business school, it's at an early stage, but it's growing fast with huge enthusiasm and engagement in both parts, I may say. Again, thanks to colleagues for that. And uh, I'm, I'm quite excited. These courses will be coming on the, into the public domain in the next 18 to 24 months. So I would watch the space. And I, I may see if any of the guests in the call tonight are interested in engaging further with that. Uh, I'd, I'd be very happy to have that conversation because the, I think it'll, it'll reach out to a different group of students and, um, and that might be very interesting. And a final connection, if I may, Margaret. Um, we haven't talked about the university's work on so-called MD20 recruitment. That is ensuring that the University of Glasgow brings students in from that group of society that sits in the most socioeconomically deprived category, that being, if you like, the 20% most deprived groups. And actually, Glasgow's leading the way here. And when you start to think about the kinds of courses that might appeal, I think we are going to broaden our appeal and make us an even, even more exciting place to appeal to those who come from socioeconomic disadvantage. It's really important that we as a university take that responsibility if we're going to breed true to our civic university origins, which is something I'm absolutely committed to. Thank you. So we, I'm conscious of time. I have one more question for you. Um, in fact, it's a hybrid of two questions, if I may. Um, so we have on this call some the people who have given us an incredible amount of support over the last few years um, and, you know, who are part of an alumni community that stretches all the way around the globe. And um, if you were to kind of, if we were to say to you, kind of what, what role can people play in championing and advocating um, for the work that you're doing? What would you like them to do? And if people were to support you or your, the college over the next kind of few months or years, where do you think that philanthropy would be best directed? Yeah, thank you, Margaret. Um, well, of course, this is where I get my knuckles wrapped by Margaret by saying that money helps, but actually, <laughs> actually, engagement, involvement and expertise and commitment helps I, possibly even more. Um, so how can our alumnus community help us? Well, first of all, there is huge expertise and for me, almost more importantly, huge connectivity. 
into communities that we need to get to. I'm, I, I'm just scanning the chat and, and, and Jess has made a, a really important point about the United States. Now, we all understand there's a very different philanthropic culture in the United States. And by the way, also rapidly growing in Asia. And some of the donations that are made in Asia and the United States leave my eyes watering, but that's not jealousy, it's simply respect. And then we have to rise to the challenge. And by the way, if you look at the competitiveness of UK and especially Scottish life sciences on the global stage, I think we have a lot to shout about. And yet we don't shout as loud as we, as we should. And I accept that as a criticism, actually. And one of the pieces of work I'm doing with, um, with Rachel Sanderson and indeed with, with Margaret and our team is to try and tell the stories more clearly, with more impact and with more authenticity. We tend to talk to the Sunday Post instead of the New York Times, and that's something we're going to change. So our alumni can help us, of course, with philanthropic donation. And if there are areas that are of particular interest, we would love to engage in a very active way. I have to tell you, our, the, 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 my, my staff colleagues in MVLS like nothing better than a friend of the university joining them. And when we can do that in real life rather than in virtual life, you'd be very, very welcome. It will be mutually inspiring for them to meet you and I hope for you to meet them. There's nothing quite like seeing the, the heights of their eyes and the enthusiasm, particularly of the young scientists. They're just amazing. They humble me on a fairly regular basis. So connectivity and fiscal donation, but also advice. There are lifetimes of advice stored up in our alumnus community. And uh, I think if I've said anything important today, it was a recognition that although we have a hugely talented faculty, it doesn't know enough about enough. And so reaching out to you to unashamedly ask for your expertise, for us to listen to your thoughts, and I promise you we'll act on them, and to have you become even more a part of our community at the thinking doing level, for you to be uh, our critical friends. I, I, one of my favorite, um, favorite Oscar Wilde sayings is, you know, your, your enemy stabs you in the back, your, your friends stab you in the front. Now, lest that be an invitation, I'm not inviting grievous bodily harm here, but we, we would like your criticism as well as your friendship because that will make us better. There has to be a degree of introspection. There has to be a degree of self-evaluation as we seek our global ambitions. I, otherwise, it becomes rhetoric. And I hope what you're hearing today is that we're going to move well beyond rhetoric to select those areas of expertise where we believe we can make a difference and then get on and do it. And I would love with those three strands, connectivity, yes, of course, philanthropic donation, and finally, your expertise. With those three stands, what a difference we could make. Thank you, Ian. And thank you so much for your time in, in preparing the presentation that you've given to us today and for sharing all your knowledge and expertise with us. It's, it's really appreciated. Thank you. Um, so it, leaves, it behoves me to wrap up this evening. I just wanted to thank everybody for coming along tonight. It is tremendous to see you and to hear your questions. Um, as the world slowly, we hope, opens up again, we're, we're enjoying starting to get back out on the road to see people face to face, um, which has been really lovely and we hope will continue over the next year. Um, we have some events to look forward to. Um, we have our Global World Changing Conversation event, um, which will be on Burns Night and themed around Robert Burns. So please do look out for that if you haven't already signed up to it. We are also very hopeful to be going ahead with our London Burn Supper and our New York Burn Supper, which will happen a little bit later in the year. And there will be information coming out about that without before too long. Um, so we'll keep you posted. Um, for those questions that we haven't managed to address this evening, if there are any, we will circulate responses by email. Um, and Thank you all once again for coming. Thank you again to Ian um, and to colleagues for setting up this evening. It's, um, it's been great to see and hear from everybody. So until next time, um, goodbye and thank you once again. <laughs>